Um, I was introduced to opiates for the first time. And for a lot of people, that happens in a lot of different ways. Uh, it could be from their parents' medicine cabinet. It could be from uh, surgery where they're given the opiates. Um, and in, um, I don't want to get into discussing all about opiates, etc. But needless to say, for certain people, one taste is all it takes, and that's all it took for me. Um, and it was back to my illusion of thinking that, wow, look at me. I am, I, am, I am doing really well in this tough city, in this tough conservatory, and I'm only using heroin on Saturdays, man. Like, who cares? Once a week is all I need. That's it, and I'm fine. The rest of the week it was pot, and it was booze, and whatever else. But on Saturdays I had my, my dope. And before you know it, that it just was getting louder. And the time that I was spending alone was starting to really fill me with these concepts of shame and feeling isolated and feeling like no one understood what was going on inside of me. And my thoughts weren't always making sense. But on Saturdays they did because that's when I got so high I thought that I felt the way I was meant to feel. Well, of course, there ended up being a tough week somewhere in there and a tough week, a Wednesday, feels like not that big of a deal. So I usually do on Saturdays, I'll do Wednesday. So I did it a Wednesday. And then all of a sudden it became Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And then the next thing you know, it was every single day of the week. And I wasn't at this point, I wasn't a party addict by any means, you know. I was somebody that woke up very early every morning to cut my dope, to go into some of the most dangerous situations in some of the more dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago, one of the most dangerous cities in America, and the things that I would have to see and experience to get my dope, get myself well, and then go back to a day of living a very challenging and high structured and high, highly stressful uh, collegiate lifestyle. And I was so impressed with myself, you guys. I was so <laughs> amazed. Like, been there. I'm doing it. This is how I'm going to spend the rest of my life. And that's how I can succeed. And I will be fine. This is what I'm going to do. Well, I know there's a lot of people here today who are working with people in recovery, who are in recovery, who are trying to get into recovery. And as you all know, eventually you're walking out on that bridge, on that lie, and it falls out from underneath you. So just a few months after walking across the stage, taking a diploma, having talent agents tell me that they had TV shows ready for me to go and audition for and act on and getting an actual job on a TV show. Just a few months after that, the literally the proverbial bottom dropped out. And all of a sudden, within a matter of literally weeks that became just a few months, I was homeless. I had no phone anymore, no way of communicating with family and friends. And when I did, it was calling them collect on pay phones, just coming up with stories that at first they believed, that got more and more exaggerated and more and more uh, frightening to get money. And within six months, I was completely out on my own, homeless, sleeping in a car or in a park, just like this one here. To support myself, I was lying to friends and family until eventually they had to tough love me and cut me off. I was stealing. I became, uh, this was back when people still bought CDs. Remember before yeah. iTunes? I was real good at stealing laser discs and CDs and then turning around and selling them and supporting my habit that way and stealing anything else that I could get my hands on. And it was no longer a tap, tapping on my shoulder. At this point, it was banging, banging on me. That darkness, that ugly spirit, that depression, and that, that mental imbalance that I had been struggling with for so long had now run so rampant and so untreated and so without communication that the only moments I got to escape from it into complete numbness was my addiction. So that was half and half of my day, either completely numbed out or completely miserable and feeling completely alone and like nobody understood me, nobody would get me and I could never talk to or connect with another human being. And on top of that, one of the really sick 
evil things about the darkness of this stuff is that it began to convince me that my existence wasn't only terrible for myself, but it was terrible for every other person around me. So that I was such a black mark on my family and on the people that love me and my society, my community, that I was better off not being alive. I, I, I'll tell you really quick two stories um, about being out on the street. Um, one, one, well actually two that involve law enforcement. Um, one I was still trying at this point to do, uh, before, I had, before I had completely given up the acting thing, I was going to continue to try and think that I could get back in front of um, casting and auditions. And I, and I got picked up one time on the west side of Chicago by two uh, vice cops who had recently had, had lost a friend who had been shot in some gang warfare and they were just over it and the system they thought was effed and they were angry, they were angry at addicts and they were angry at dealers and they took me into an alley and one of them put on his gloves and he said, these are my beat down gloves, you're not coming back in my neighborhood anymore and he said, where do you want it, your face or your body? and I didn't know what he meant and the other one said, you should take it in the body, kid. And, I, and as soon as he went to hit me, I said, the body, please, I'm an actor. Don't hit my face. i got to protect this. Um, but those guys were caught up in a system that I was a part of as well that, that, that felt so helpless. And shortly after that time, another law enforcement officer stopped me coming out of a drug house where I had just been buying. And he took me aside and he said, son, I'm going to pray for you. I don't know what it's going to take for you to get well, but I don't believe that locking you up tonight so that you're back here tomorrow is going to solve anything, so here's what I'm going to do. And he said real loudly, where did you say that they hid the drugs? <laughs> oh, shit. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, where, where did you say that the guy put the drugs? Was it up in the... Oh, okay, thank you. And he knew that I was never going to come back to that neighborhood again. And right. I did it. Um, I also, speaking of lows, you go through a lot of lows in your addiction, and one of my lows, I was going into a church one time, I even cringe talking about it to this day, and I um, was looking for anything that I could steal, and there happened to be a wedding going on, and uh, I took some presents off the wedding table at this wedding um, to go and sell at a pawn shop, and I've always wondered if I... Um, caused a rift in that family and the wife, the bride or the groom like you know weeks later was like man uncle bill is such a cheapskate he didn't get us a present for our wedding <laughs> and then uncle bill is saying to aunt sally you know those ungrateful kids we gave them that great present they never thanked us for their present so i just feel a little guilty about that but i um you may think that uh breaking or stealing from a church is as low as a person can get but it wasn't for me uh the lowest point that i hit was sitting in a park like I say, just like this one, just like in any of our cities, just around any of our people in Chicago, Lincoln Park, watching the joggers go by, and um, I had a dirty, rusty needle in my, in my, in my, my works, and I said, uh, there's, a, there's a, what looks to be a wealthy young mother across the park with her, uh, with her infant in a, in a stroller, and I thought, I've heard of people doing this in, um, I've heard of this, that people hold people up at needlepoint. So you give me what you've got or I'll stick you with this and I may have eight. These thoughts went through this mind. The guy that's standing right here in front of you right now. That's, this guy, he was just on that side of the park. Does that make sense? Like. So, so that guy had that thought, and this guy at one point had that thought, and by the grace of God, I didn't. I tried, but I couldn't do it, and I thank God for that. But I soon found myself after that, I accumulated as much as I could possibly get my hands on dope, that is. I put all of it into my veins, and it didn't take me out. So then I cut myself, and I just laid there with as much dope as I could have in myself, bleeding in a bathtub. And I was sitting on this moment in my life where for the first time that tap, tap, tapping that had become a bang, bang, banging was this dark form sitting next to me, quite literally, you could call me crazy, many have, that I saw sitting beside me in this bathroom telling me, do you get it yet? This is it. You're alone. Your life is hell. And there's nobody that's ever going to benefit from you being on this earth. 
And again, by the grace of God, this miracle, I had what it, it, it happens in so many of us addicts who are fortunate enough to get into recovery, and so many of us suffering from mental illness or mental imbalance who can get into treatment, but that I, I had, I had a, a spiritual awakening where I almost came out of myself, and instead of just seeing that bathroom with this darkness telling me how alone I was, I saw the bathroom, the apartment, the entire city of Chicago, the entire country, and it was as if it was sitting in God's hand. And my family was out there somewhere on that pump, and people who were complete strangers to me that I hadn't met yet, that I was going to meet in meetings, that I was going to meet in treatment, that I was going to meet in therapy, were out there, and they were populating all the fingers and all the skin cells of this hand, and I was in the middle of that. And this light lit in me that I was going to fight to live. And so I did, and I was thankfully um, put in a hospital, and then I was put in a state run, a uh, mental facility in Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, for 30 days. I kicked, strapped to a cot, um, uh, hallucinating, screaming, um, losing all control of my bodily function. Great times. Uh, and I, um, <laughs> coming out of there, as I started to put a treatment plan in, 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 in together, I needed help, and I knew we needed treatment. And my sister, my family never gave up on me, by the way. Remember this. My family never gave up on me. They didn't answer my calls anymore. They were waiting, but they never gave up on me. Nor did all these strangers in this you know, public health hospital that I was at or the law enforcement that had to transport me from place to place. These people never gave up on me. Um, and I, 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 my sister found a place called Valley Hope. Uh, there's a number of them around the country, but there's one in Atchison, Kansas. And I went there straight from the hospital and transported there. Um, they had a sliding scale program that was really helpful because at that point I had no insurance. This was long before any changes in healthcare and I was at a loss. I didn't know what I was going to do. From there I went into Oxford housing and I got into sober living and I had an incredible start to my sobriety and then surprise I relapsed and that <laughs> happens. It happens a lot and I hate to say it but it's not part of the deal but for many of us it was. So it took me a couple stumbles and a couple of tries, but eventually I found myself back in the city of Chicago, slowly but surely accruing well time. And I learned, for me personally, the journey towards recovery wasn't only about dealing with my addiction and my disease of addiction, but also the depression and the mental imbalances that I had been struggling with my whole life, which up until then I hadn't had a way to describe or discuss. And again, through the help of sliding scale and finding uh, opportunities to my community, I was able to talk to people that were able to help me and get me on a path. So I'm going to use my invisible remote control really quickly and fast forward a little bit, but I spent some time working sweeping popcorn in a movie theater. I was a telemarketer and I was a guy with a college degree from a prestigious university, but I just had to do it one day at a time, which turned into one week at a time, which turned into one month at a time. I had a small little studio apartment that cost $450 a month. I barely had enough that I was making for groceries, and I did that for almost five years. And that's how long it took for me to get that confidence and to believe in myself that I was actually really getting somewhere. That sounds like a long time, I know, but that was my journey. So I made it those five years, and one day I was... Um, in the sixth year of living that way, and I missed acting, and I missed what I loved doing so much, but I never knew if I was going to be able to do it again. And a friend of mine came and saw me. I was working in a movie theater, and he said, I'm directing a big play. I want you to come and do it. And, um, and I did. And a casting director happened to see that. And six, seven years into my, on almost the seventh year of my, of my journey into sobriety, all of a sudden, I was back. And I was paying my bills, and I was going grocery shopping, and I was going to movies, and I was buying ice cream, and I was spending time with my family, and I was starting to build a relationship eventually even with another person, like a romantic relationship. And I, um, and I was able to start acting again, doing the thing that I always wanted to do, that I loved doing, but never knew if I could again. 